evening. And welcome to our Good Friday service this April 7th of 2023. We are certainly thankful for all those who are gathered here this evening and for those gathered online. I wanted to take a moment as you heard the wonderful playings of Kathy to say thank you, Kathy, for being here tonight and for all of the volunteers that you will see throughout the evening as we journey through our Good Friday service. Our Good Friday service is a chance for us indeed to come together on this mournful day when our Savior died upon the cross. It's a chance for us to come together in our grief, in our prayers, and in our worship to join together in this holy week as we journey toward that wonderful Sunday moment of the resurrection. In order to begin today, let us now listen to this moment of reflection and prepare ourselves for worship.
All of the parts of the program are either on your sheet that you grabbed on your way in or will be on the screen as we move through tonight. Our service is truly meant to be one that we can engage in comfortably how we are and where we are. In order to do that, let us now join in our call to presence, confession, and worship. On Good Friday, we place ourselves as far from you as possible, blessed Savior. And remember how we left you alone. Yes, you, who has never abandoned even the worst of us. Jesus, hear our prayers of grief and regret. Jesus, as you linger between palms and an empty tomb, we have done wrong to turn our backs on you. We ask forgiveness through our deeds, through generosity and action within our congregation and community. Jesus, we repent and solemnly regret the cost of our sin. Maybe one day we can learn from the cross, but tonight we must confess and accept it as part of who we are and what we have done to you. Jesus, we confess and cry out at your sacrifice. And while tonight we must grieve and wait, there is hope come Sunday. Jesus, we cannot rewrite our story, but we may add new chapters. We can strive to become better people. Those who would ask for your release, who would beg the authorities to grant your clemency, who would treat your teachings as the roadmap we have been waiting for to lead us to world-changing love. We can be those who you would be proud to call yours. So be with us as we grieve, remember, tremble, and just maybe hope. Jesus, hear our prayers of grief and regret, and by your grace, may we be your love to the world. We're now going to go through the passion of our Savior. As we walk through this, like we traditionally have, you'll hear a reading, and then one verse from Were You There, sung a cappella by Diana Paler. This is the passion of our Savior. The first reading is from John chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who, was, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Ju Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given to me? To the, so the soldiers, their officer, and the temple police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Anas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year, Caiaphas was the one who had advised the authorities, and it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. 
but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it comes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 18 through 32. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. When the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching, Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to about this. I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the people come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answered the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. If I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas said, sent him beyond to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. He asked him, you are not the one of this, this, his disciples, are you? He denied it, said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. In early, it was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat at the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to him, them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The temple authorities replied, we have not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to, fill for what, to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree?
first reading is John 18, verse 33 through 19, 7. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again and summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from, be, from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is the truth? After he said this, he went out to the temple authorities again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming to him and saying, Hail, King of Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The temple authorities answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he claims to be the Son of God. Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they pierced him in the The fourth reading is from John 19, 8 through 24. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you? and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the chief priests cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the empire, emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. 
Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the people, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The priest priests the chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golotha. Golotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many people read this inscri inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew in Latin and in Greek. When the chief priests said to Pilate, do not write the king of Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing, they cast lots. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Our fifth reading comes from the Gospels of John, chapter 19, verses 25 through 30, and Luke 23, verses 46 through 56. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all those who knew him 
including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been led before, laid before. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how the body was laid. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments. But on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the Will you please bow your heads in a moment of prayer? Gracious God, as we gather here tonight and hear your word, hear song, hear scripture, hear prayer, are with one another. Open our ears and our hearts to all that you speak, and may everything we do bring glory unto you. Amen. Throughout Lent, we've been journeying along, going through the seven last words of Christ upon the cross. And tonight, <clears throat> we reach the final words. My Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Scottish theologian and preacher James Stocker, in his book, The Trial and Death of Jesus Christ, had this to say when reflecting on these specific last words of Christ on the cross. The most momentous question which the dying can ask, or which the living can ask in the prospect of death, is if a person dies, shall they live again? And for the answer to this question, Stocker later tells us, it is to Christ we have to go. He has the words of eternal life. He spoke on this subject without hesitation of obscurity. And his dying word proves that he believed for himself what he taught others. Not only, however, has he, by his teaching, brought life and immortality to light. He is himself the guarantee of the doctrine, for he is our immortal life. Because we are united to him, we know we can never perish. Nothing, not even death, can separate us from his love. As Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. People, this is what is so important about this night when we gather to remember Christ dying upon the cross. That in these last words of his sent up as a prayer to the heavens, as a prayer to our God, whom Christ called Father, that our souls were forever also commended to eternal life. We hear this time of year the familiar scripture. We walk through the story of the passion. Perhaps we weep thinking about the cost of the cross and what Christ's sacrifice meant. Maybe we have guilt or shame for the sins which we knowingly or unknowingly have committed that Christ continues to forgive through the finished work of the cross. 
but what God longs for us to hear in these final words, for us to remember as we reflect, for us to hold on to throughout every waking moment of our life, and to trust in no matter what living or dying may bring, is the eternal promise fulfilled through the Spirit continuing on. This world may wreak havoc to our bodies. Our sins may lay blame to our flesh. Our lives may not be of ease or comfort. Our minds may be subject to toil and torment. But when we have breathed our last earthly breath, it is only this flesh that perishes, while our souls, our spirits, our eternal selves meet with Christ and we pray as Christ prayed that God would indeed receive us. And yes, we will have bodies, and no, we don't know what they will look like. In fact, no one truly knows what they will look like, what age our bodies may be, or if we will even look like this. But this is not the important question. The importance is that thanks to Christ who lived, died, was resurrected, and will one day come again, we too can pray, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit and trust in the promise of eternal life. But moreover, my prayer tonight is that you hear a hope in this message that we all too often forget. That on this night when we come together to remember our Savior who was slain for our sins, that we would not just hear a message about how we are promised eternal life after we die, but that we could also hear how we are supposed to live into this freedom with every living breath that remains. In other words, because Christ commended his spirit into God's hands, because Christ sacrificed and gave everything for us, because we are guaranteed this eternal life. What is preventing us from living? Why did Christ go through this torment, this pain, this death, this eventual resurrection? Why did Christ speak these words to guarantee our eternal life? Why would Christ do all of this for the countless lost lambs like ourselves, why would Christ sacrifice so much for us? These are the questions that this night should leave ringing in our ears. And the answer to each of these questions is our reason for living. The answer is love. God loves us. And that answer is what we must share tonight, tomorrow, on blessed Easter morning, and every moment of every day of every year. Because leaving here tonight in solemn silence is fitting. Leaving here tonight and being saddened by the cost of the cross is important. Leaving here tonight sickened at our world which continues to hate, to disregard, to be filled with violence, and to do everything counter to Christ is appropriate. But if we leave in this state and do not trust in God's love, or we leave and do not work to fill every corner we live with love, or we leave and forget about tonight and toss it by the wayside, then Christ's sacrifice and his ministry, and his life, and his death, and his resurrection are vacant of the lives Christ sacrificed everything to save. Which leads me to say that perhaps the most momentous question we actually can ask ourselves then is, if I am forgiven, if I am saved, if I have the promise of eternal life, if death itself is conquered and my spirit is in God's hands, indeed, if I am loved by Christ himself, how should I live? 
Christ, may we be your hands while we have breath. Holy Spirit, fill us with light and love. Father, into your hands we commend our spirit. Amen. Will you please bow your heads in a moment of prayer? Faithful God, we praise you that you love us and that you have come to us and Jesus to reconcile the world to yourself. We thank you that Jesus walked the path of obedience all the way to the cross and that you raised Jesus up to draw us to yourself. Jesus handed himself over to death. So teach us, like Jesus, to hand ourselves over in life, in love, for you, for one another, and for all your people. As we who have been baptized into a life with Christ, may we also die with Christ, that we may also rise with Christ that we may take part in your work, God, of suffering and redeeming love, lifting up the oppressed, binding the brokenhearted, challenging the powerful, and drawing all into a community of love. We lift up our prayers for the world, God, still so full of suffering, still so shadowed by crosses, knowing that you have loved your creation from the beginning. Please hear us now, blessed Savior, as we pray silently those prayers of our hearts. And we join our heart with yours, God, in love for the world as we offer ourselves to you through Jesus Christ, in whose name we now pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn, in other years we have sang together, What Wondrous Love Is This? But I found a very touching and appropriate, in my humble opinion, video that I would like to play with a nice picture on the screen. This is What Wondrous Love Is This. It's by Chelsea Moon with the Franz Brothers. Let us now hear, indeed, how wondrous and amazing our God's love is.
In a moment, I will give a benediction, and then you'll notice in your program that it says quiet departing. Please stay as long as you need in this space. Take as long as it takes you to depart as we go forth from this moment today, journeying through Holy Week, making our way to the ultimate resurrective moment on Easter Sunday. And so, brothers and sisters, let the empty cross be a reminder for us. Yes, of the cost that our sins took a sacrifice of our Savior, but more so of the love of our God that was so wondrous and amazing, majestic and unconditional that we would be sent God Himself to save us from our sins, to free us and forgive us eternally, to have a resting place that is not of this world, and for us to live into a glorious, glorious light. Go forth with that light. Go forth with that love. Go forth in the peace of Christ. Amen.